I am a professor, but I'm just as much of a fraud as Alistair is, I think, <laughs> uh, in that uh, I'm going to uh, not use some of the resources that I hope we might explore in conversation later on. Um, I spend a significant amount of my time enmeshed in what you might call the politics of bioethics. Um, I got interested in this idea of ownership, uh, listening to what I was hearing from people when I was chair of the Human Genetics Commission about their sense of this is my data. Um, and one of the questions that Josh uh, had on, the, I don't know if it was from Josh, I think it probably was this one, about uh, what can law achieve in the light of any of these concerns? So the quick answer is I don't think law ever achieves very much. <laughs> um, but there is quite a lot of thinking around the, the idea of what it might mean to talk about this question in terms of uh, ownership. The Nuffield Council on Bioethics when it did its work on bio, big, big data and in the context of biodata particularly um, in 2015, felt that probably our current tools were ins insufficient to grapple with the questions that we got. In particular, the idea that you could deal with this by consent was problematic because at the point when you want to engage with people donate their data, you really can't explain to them what's going to be done with that data um, later on. So the idea of consent, at least at the access um, point, doesn't do the work that we usually think it does. Similarly, the alternative in the data protection paradigm, which is uh, uh, anonymization, can make everything okay, doesn't really work if you're in a context where what you're trying to record is going to be pretty unique to the uh, data subject, and we now know, uh, even though we suspected it perhaps earlier on, is prone to re-identification. Um, so those things can't do the type of work that we used to think they could do in terms of giving people reasons to uh, share their data. So I want to reflect um, for the short time I've got on whether or not thinking in terms of ownership is a useful way in, into those uh, sorts of dilemmas. Um, and I don't want to suggest the answer is yes or no. I want to suggest that it raises a set of questions that are quite interesting questions about what might be at stake. Uh, and I'd be very happy to pick up on all sorts of uh, other avenues of law a bit later on. So the nub of this is how should we think about my data? Do we think about it as being data of which I'm the subject, data about me? Or is it somehow data that is mine uh, in the sense that I own uh, other things? Now, if we think about it in terms of it being something that I own, we get drawn in uh, to certain types of things going wrong that, that we have at stake. It's mine, and it's somehow worse le less now than it was previously. My book is damaged. Um, my car has been uh, scratched. Uh, so you have a, a, a type of devaluing uh, exercise. So does sharing my data devalue it? In some way might be a, an interesting question. A second thing we might think about is if it's mine, do other people interfering with it somehow obstruct my use of it? Um, so does sharing the data stop me having access to it? Does it stop me using it? Uh, in which case someone's interfering with my rights. But actually, it has no impact on me to share it, other than maybe giving me some other things I might want to do. It's not really an intrusion with property type of question. And then if we think about things that we own, we tend to worry about misappropriation, people taking it away from me, uh, and theft. So, so is it that it was mine, and it somehow ceases to be mine when it's shared uh, in these uh, data sets? Now, actually, I don't think those are very good at capturing the type of concerns that, that we've got. We're mostly more bothered about impacts that it will have on our pe ourselves uh, as people. So we're interested in, uh, and your survey elicits some of these questions, although in a sense it builds in. This has been one of the questions I know about. Um, does sharing data give rise to some form of risks uh, of harm? Will I be worse off as a result of it? Is it somehow change my sense of uh, privacy and uh, the space that's mine? Uh, does it somehow stop me being me and able to act uh, as myself? Does it in some way interfere with my ability to do things? Those are all things that property is really important about. Having property helps me protect myself. 
Uh, it helps me protect myself against intrusions from other people, and it helps me do the things um, th that I want. It's not that they're unrelated to property, but our attempts to address those things don't have to be limited to um, uh, the question of is it mine uh, or is it not. So if we take the issues around discrimination, um, we might ask ourselves, is the answer to that to stop people having access to my data? Or is the answer to stop using them in particular ways? So the moratorium on using molecular genetic test results uh, is an attempt to say the wrong is using that data in particular ways that will harm me, and we make it illegal for you to do that wrong, rather than saying you can't gather um, the data. Now, actually, if we're interested in those personal protection issues, it doesn't really matter whether it's data about me or data that belongs to me. We have a set of things we need to identify are socially unacceptable, uh, and we uh, try and uh, avoid it. So we have in our Human Tissue Act, prompted by the Human Genetics Commission's uh, work, uh, a criminal offence called DNA theft. Uh, and it's an offence which is actually uh, holding uh, bodily material, which is DNA manufactured by the body of a person who's alive. Now, the manufacturing is quite an interesting idea, and I want to come back to the manufacturing um, idea. So this suggests that DNA didn't somehow pre-exist. Uh, it's being created out, out of what and where. It's wrong for me to hold that if I hold it either without your consent or some other justification. But one of the justifications that the statute builds in is using it for your diagnosis uh, and treatment. So actually, the thing we'd usually say requires consent is excluded from the scope of consent un under that definition. Now, what's really at stake in this is about a social judgment that unless you have really serious disincentives um, to collect DNA data, people will gather it, and that will lead to social harms. To capture that policy, we've turned it into a, a criminal offence. We've used a label, which is a property label, uh, about theft. But that doesn't really explain what its function is uh, and why it's important. What we're saying then is people may be harmed uh, if their DNA is taken from the hairbrush that they leave in the hotel room uh, and then analysed, uh, or uh, to identify whether or not someone is really their child, um, a whole series of things. But the harms are about the impact uh, that it might have. It doesn't really matter whether I really do or, or don't own it. And it's actually quite problematic to think about the data as being owned uh, in some sense. And there are lots of reasons um, to do that. Um, we tend to think about uh, things that we uh, own as existing out there. Uh, we either acquire them uh, or, or they're given to us. Not as something that appears out of nothing. Now, when I first studied law, um, we used to study Roman law in the institution, not this one, but almost as ancient. Um, uh, and there's a really interesting set of questions in Roman law about who owns paintings and manuscripts and, and sculptures. And broadly, Roman lawyers thought that if someone wrote on a piece of your parchment, the person who owned the parchment owned what, what came out of it. If a painter um, nicked your um, canvas and your paints and created a work of art, they owned the work of art. Um, so somehow there's a difference between where we put the value of the creativity. Sculptures, they couldn't quite let make their mind up, which was the, um, uh, the real combination. So this health data, this genomic data about me, is it something that's there and given, or is it something that's created? Um, I have no way of interpreting that set of numbers that Anna put up. I also have no way of acquiring it. So it's not just that I don't understand this. I would not have it if I didn't engage with a system that tested me uh, and, and did the analysis. So my data that I'm being invited to share is not something that actually I have any access to, except in some form of engagement. Even holding that data as independent bits doesn't mean anything until put into some reference framework, interpreted in some way. So I don't really have this until I engage in some form of partnership with a person or an institution uh, or a system. So the idea that it pre-exists and it's therefore mine and I'm being asked to give it to someone it is a little bit misleading. And then you get the question of, well, what actually is this thing that I own? Um, uh, is it, you know, what is my genome? Is it made up of a number of different 
chromosomes? Is it made up of uh, the subsets um, of those things? Is it what the label is given for the totality? Um, we'll have to decide if we decide ownership makes sense of at what level I own it. Do I own it as the person who is a, uh, a body in time and space? Or do we break me down and reduce me to various uh, components? And where am I going to bite um, that sort of claim? Um, and that, too, makes it problematic to think uh, about this as just easily mine. And then there's a couple of other factors which I think help us think about whether or not this intuitive idea that somehow this is my genome um, that I, I'm being invited to share with somebody else. One of the things we tend to think about, uh, about property is that other people using it obstruct my uses of it. But actually one of the things about data is that using it doesn't use it up. Unlike biological samples, if you have a, uh, a tissue bank, every time you use a bit of that tissue, it won't be available to use again. But actually data you reuse and it's still going to be there um, to be reused um, by other people. We don't uh, exhaust it. And finally, in terms of oddity of data as a thing, um, most of this stuff that we're claiming is mine, I have in common with not just my family, but other human beings, with vegetables. Um, the, the vast majority of the stuff that goes up is actually not special to me. Um, it's only tiny bits of it that make it different, and we're not even quite sure which of those um, are most significant. So as you begin to think about the question, does it make much sense to say this is mine uh, in ownership sense, it, it becomes a little bit problematic. So then I ask myself, drawing on um, political philosophy and jurisprudence about, well, might we think the sense of mine, the sense of self that involves in this, is linked somehow between why we think property is a useful institution. Fundamentally, we use property to manage access and use um, of resources, but we give a lot of explanations about why that might be worth doing. The dominant one uh, in uh, the industrialised West is the sort of claim that somehow this... Property is an extension of our self and identity. Um, most of the modern literature associates this with uh, John Locke and the idea of mixing your, your labour. Um, but somehow, I start owning my body if I own nothing else, um, and then I mix it with things, and I've extended myself into that, and I should be entitled to some uh, claim uh, over what's happened. Um, but whose labour is mixed in a genetic test? No. I've put some resource in, I've given a sample, but the work has probably been done by technicians. Um, the analysis is done by... If we were trying to fix the labour, we're back to our parchment, painting, uh, sculpture question. That The skill that's invested in that is probably not um, the patient's. So if we're thinking about whose it is, it quite easily comes into fact, well, maybe the actual ownership claim uh, is more strongly asserted by, if not the individual clinicians involved, but the system uh, in which um, they do it. Other reasons why we think about justifications for using property are that it's a way of making sure we don't waste things in dispute, but actually manage carefully uh, our resources. And we'll touch on that, I think, more in the final session um, of today. Um, but actually, we need to think about the fact, if this genetic information <coughs> is only accessible to me, because I collaborate with somebody else, I donate my bodily resource, but I get uh, their engagement, they are mixing scarce resources with that. So the idea that then they have no stake in how that's used seems to me uh, difficult to reconcile with this sense of we're trying to find a way of explaining the appropriate use of scarce resources. And then there's a set of arguments about property which say, well, unless you give somebody ownership rights over things that they're working on, they won't bother putting in the effort. So typically, if, I, if you want people to till the soil, they have to have some reasonable expectation of getting the fruit that grows in it. If I put all the work in and then someone bigger and stronger than me uh, comes and takes away the fruit at harvest time, uh, then I'm not going to bother in the first place because I'm going to gain nothing. And of course, this is analogous to the uh, industrial uh, claims about, well, you have to give us strong property rights uh, in what comes out of this work or we won't spend the money uh, in developing um, things. So we need to think a bit about what sort of investments do we want to uh, incentivize. And of course investments are of lots of different types. Um, one of those investments is actually people being prepared to donate um, their information. So what do we need to give them in order to 
be prepared um, to be part of that. And that gets to a sense of mutuality. What, what is the sense in which it stays enough mine that I hope to gain from it? And I'll come back to that in a moment. And then finally, there's a justification of property, which is around the fact that if you don't have any property, you're unlikely to be able to put many of your projects into operation. So the loss of the ability to have information about my uh, health and well-being status and prognosis, that loss would also have an impact on my ability to make choices. So we might want to create a sense of we need to protect my access to the products of my investment and my body into some form of testing in order to promote my choices. But we can do that without necessarily taking away some other questions. So those are all ways in which property theorists seek to think that we might be able to um, justify the idea uh, of running property processes. But they interestingly don't take us into the sense of ownership that most people have in mind when they say it's my genome. Most people have that in mind when they say it's mine, not yours. That's a private property idea that says we're differentiating this because I have a stake in it that you don't have. I'm entitled to do things to it that you can't do, uh, and I have great control over that. And that's the paradigm that gets us into the idea that it's up to me whether I share my um, genetic information or not. But we might think about the types of claim that it's mine slightly differently. So we might want to draw a distinction between something which is differentiated being mine and not yours, between various ways in which they might be ours. So one of those is to say certain ways of managing resources, allocating property and controlling them and giving choices over how they operate are for the common good. The net benefit of us as a collective uh, is dealt with uh, by the idea that this is seen to be something controlled uh, and don't. I think built into Anna's survey is a, uh, an assumption um, about that in the distinction between for-profit and non-profit. There's a sense that people intuitively see a difference between things that are managed on a collective property basis and things that are managed on a private property basis. The idea that something could start as mine and become a pharmaceutical company's is different in people's minds from it starts as mine and it becomes a uh, an NHS good or uh, an academic good. I'd be more comfortable, I think, if we could find a word that didn't define academic research as being not for profit, because that sort of builds in the expectation um, uh, for personal reputational gain, impact, uh, and high ref scores and promotion and <laughs> getting Alistair to a chair um, uh, versus uh, profit might be a, a fairer uh, comparison. But the other one that's interesting is the sense that not that we should organise this as, as controlled by someone in the greater good, but actually we should organise it as commonly accessible. So if you go back to the Human Genome Project, the big fight to make this open access, common property that everybody could use um, as a platform, as opposed to something that was held by a particular group, arguably from their point of view, in order to achieve the greater collective good, but in a way that then would exclude others. You see this sort of question about the difference between how we see this uh, as, as being mine. And then finally, um, the fact that even if we think property is a useful collecting idea, it really doesn't take us very far. Because even if I own things, there are some things I'm not allowed to do with them. You know, so I can't use my property for things that are designed as harmful. And even if I own things, the state has a reasonable expectation of having part of that uh, in order to pay for the infrastructure that protects them. So at the very least, even if you are um, a uh, believer in the minimal state, um, you still accept that a small degree of taxation to pay for police people to stop them taking away my property is a necessary part of recognising um, my rights. So what this then boils down to is a sense in which we have a core idea we use about ownership, but the margins of what it means and how it expresses itself are largely a matter of societal, political, social negotiations. So to end up with where we seem to be in relation to my data and, and sharing, we've dug ourselves in the NHS in England a very big pit um, through care.data. data. Um, and we're now about to go out into some form of public conversation uh, 
about opt-outs from the sharing of, of health information. And the third Caldicott report has argued that uh, it should be uh, a step of the government to give people not just a single choice, as Jeremy Hunt would have liked, but a, a set of ranged choices, suggesting that it would be, are you happy for your data to be used um, for the management of health systems, and then secondly, for broader um, research uh, and management purposes, uh, and that we should be providing people some, some choices. Now, I think if we think about this as a social contract, we need to be less passive. Um, we need to say, actually, we should be going out there, we should be saying, what we think would be an appropriate um, offer um, to people. Now, the Council on Bioethics argued that what we need to be able to do was to set out an explanation of what was expected to be done with this that could be explained to people uh, in a publicly accessible way, in a way that was morally justified, and to secure their acceptance of that way um, of a process. So actually, that pushes us much more to the sort of common collective property sense of how we get the most out of data. That we should be seeing this as up for grabs and we should be seeing it as a question of explaining why data protection brings back benefits to me. If I'm allowed to hold on to my genomic information uh, and get the benefit of the genomic revolution, if there is one, and not share, then I'm effectively engaging in what philosophers call free riding. That's to say, I'm getting everything and I'm not taking any risks as, as to going in. And that probably takes us back to the MMR-type debates that we had this morning. So I'll sit down at that point. Thanks very much. Thank you.